Hey there, my name's Mike and welcome to my channel. This is a map of all the calculus you learn as you go through physics. Now, you could look at this as all the calculus and all the math you should know going into physics, but I prefer to see it as all the math that you learn in your journey of physics because you don't learn all the math and then do all the physics. You learn the physics and as you go along, you find that you need more and more math. So this is exactly how physics started. Think of Isaac Newton when he first really started publishing things on classical mechanics. What started from looking up at the stars, seeing the way the planetary bodies move, and he said, I need more math. I need a way to describe the motion of these things, and that is what gave us calculus. The study of calculus, him, along with other mathematicians, great mathematicians, created this field of calculus, which is the mathematics of things that change. It's the mathematics of motion. And that is what we find when we start in physics. We start with a subject called classical mechanics. And it's all about the motion of things. And you can predict so much with classical mechanics. You can predict the motion of stars, the motion of falling bodies. You can predict things like projectile motion, which is the first real step into understanding stuff like rocketry and, and the equations that govern the motion of, of projectiles. It's all starting from here. And we start with very basic forms of calculus. We start with something called polynomial differentiation and polynomial integration. And these are the first things you learn in a first year calculus course. And the very basic gist of it is to, if I look at a curve like this, this is a curve of a particle with a velocity and I'm plotting it through time. So as time changes, the velocity changes. Maybe it's a projectile in the air and I'm watching it, or maybe it's a, a plane and I'm watching its change in velocity here. Now what we can do what we find is that if you take the slope at any given instantaneous point, and there's a way to do this, and you can do it with uh, something called a limit, uh, or you can do it with calculus, and we have a rule for it. It's really nice. There's simple algorithms that you apply to the formula. So if you know the function v of t, then what you're able to do is apply a set of rules. And specifically, we use something called the power rule a lot. And uh, we're able to actually determine that the velocity, if we differentiate it, it is the derivative, the time derivative of the displacement. Or in this case, I've differentiated velocity here and I have a slope here. This slope would represent acceleration. And if this sounds familiar at all to you, you may be in our Physics Foundations playlist, which do check out on my channel. We are covering physics from the ground up, starting at the very basics and building our skills eventually so that we can understand this stuff. But it starts here. And what we're talking about right here are the foundational elements of motion that is displacement, velocity, and acceleration, and you derive all of the kinematic equations by using this basic calculus. So we have polynomial differentiation here, and then something called polynomial integration. And another cool fact about this physics stuff is that if I have a curve like this, and I have a velocity curve through time that I've plotted, as I move through time, the distance under that curve, the geometric distance under here, this area, is actually representative of the total displacement that I've moved across. And it makes a lot of sense. If this was a straight line or a curve or something like, you know, like this, right, then I would have a triangle here and the area under that would, would simply be um, a, a straight line is even better. If I have a, a constant velocity, then any change in time, I'm multiplying velocity by time, which if you remember from our unit analysis video, gives us distance. So on a much more complicated level, we're able to use this, this technique called polynomial integration, which looks like this, and it gives us the information about the total distance that we've traveled. So it's a very useful formula, and we say that the displacement x of t is equal to something called the integral of velocity with respect to time, dt. And this has its own very special meaning. This is called an infinitesimal in mathematics, and it's basically the mathematical equivalent of a slice so tiny that they're practically infinite. And so there would be an infinite number of infinitesimals right here from A to B that we add up. It's a very cool concept. Um, this video isn't really designed to teach you all of this, but it's letting you see what we talk about. And the last thing in classical mechanics that gets covered is something called projectile motion. And projectile motion, like I said, allows us to predict like kind of the basics of rocketry even. And uh, the projectile motion is really cool because it's a true vector quantity. And so you're dealing with now not one-dimensional equations, like you've been dealing with these one-dimensional space, but you're now dealing in two dimensions. You have a velocity in the x direction that stays constant. And then in the y direction, you have this motion that gets pulled as you go along here. You, you, you get pulled down by gravity. And so your displacement goes up and then down and you're displacement this way pulls you through that time and you create this sort of curve and that's a parabolic arc. That's the way all projectiles fall.
And it's given in these very basic equations that you must derive using calculus. Now, in a first year course uh, with a physics for non-calculus, you know, typically physics for non-scientists, uh, you don't learn the calculus. And so you're just given these formulas kind of arbitrarily. Um, and in a, in a later video, we'll derive the kinematic equations. And you'll see that they're actually really easy to derive, which is, I think, lovely. Uh, it's a very fun thing to look at. Next up is waves and oscillations. So this is this is like physics 202. And if this was 201, then now we get into kind of the fun stuff. And the first thing you'll see here is something called a partial differential equation. Now, sometimes this will also be given to you as an ordinary differential equation, but the idea is the same. And basically, it's the fact that waves have a very interesting way of propagating. And it just so happens that the rate of a change, the, the rate of change of a wave is equal to the initial position of that wave times some constant. And there's a bunch of mathematics that go into it. But what we find is that there is a solution to this equation. And it looks something like this. And we find that we can pull out a solution um, called a sine or a sinusoidal function. And it satisfies this equation where this is a derivative. Um, and these little partial signs are something you learn in uh, usually a vector calculus course, but you can learn them elsewhere. And a partial derivative is a derivative with respect to a single variable when there are other variables to consider. So you can see how it makes a lot of sense to have this really solidified before you go into waves and oscillations. And then you have to learn these extra things. And they're, they're very cool pieces, uh, bits of knowledge, though. And waves and oscillations is definitely a cool course because you get to learn how waves actually propagate. And the visuals for waves can be really quite beautiful. Um, here's a book that I have called Elementary Wave Optics by Robert H. Webb. And note that the interference that waves create are, are very interesting. And they're useful for all sorts of technology. In fact, one of my exam problems that I'll always remember from my second year physics course was using wave dynamics to predict a leak in the coolant piping of a nuclear reactor. And you're able to do that because as waves enter things, they resonate and the resonant frequencies of things change if let's say your tube has a hole in it where, where coolant is leaking out. And so we were able to measure things from that. And there's all sorts of crazy properties of light like diffractions, this is Babinet's principle here. They're just such interesting concepts and they all stem from this singular equation down here, which is simply put the wave equation. Most of what else you do in waves and oscillations comes from classical mechanics. And so this idea of force being equal to mass times the second derivative of displacement, or F equals MA, gets used a lot as we look at uh, waves between like, like wave motion itself and oscillatory motion like a pendulum or a spring bouncing back and forth, a mass bouncing on a spring. So those are the three things you spend most of your time on in waves and oscillations. It's a good course. You learn a lot about foundational ideas using Newton's laws to pretty much predict every motion you can. That's all of classical mechanics is you start with force is equal to the mass and the acceleration of an object. So if I know the mass of something, if I know the mass of you, and I know every single force that's acting on you, and I can quantify it, then I can figure out your acceleration. And this is the beauty of deterministic um, classical mechanics is that I can then say that I know as long as those forces don't change, I can calculate any position that you've ever made from any time back, and I can calculate any position you will ever be at as long as I know the forces of you that are acting on you and your mass. And so you're able to find these really interesting things. You can predict all sorts of things. And for a while in physics, there was a, a thought when, when this stuff really became popularized in the 1600s into the 1700s and 1800s, there was a, a, a very common philosophical belief in physics that if you knew enough information, the entirety of the universe was nothing more than a very fancy clock and you could predict all of it. And so what's really cool is all this classical mechanics Within the real world, for most cases, you can predict to a, a kind of general extent the motion of anything. As long as you know the starting conditions, you can predict stuff that just seems, I mean, like magic. It's really quite fascinating. Speaking of fascinating, I think this is the best place to end. This is the last physics course you take that still counts as classical mechanics and it's electricity and magnetism. And this is where the math ramps up a little bit. This is a hard class for a lot of people. In fact, most people will say, if you're a physics major, if you're a, math, uh, a mathematics major or, or an engineer like myself, they'll say this is one of the hardest classes you take in college. Because what you have to do is apply all the vector calculus that you just learned, usually no more than about a year ago, and apply it to physics now that are honestly a little difficult at first. So this is a charged surface. Imagine like a like a Van de Graaff machine that you stick your hand on and you you know you someone's 
twisting it and pulling it and, and it builds up charge. If you put your hand on it, your hair sticks up, right? A Van de Graaff machine. Charge builds up here and there is a field permeating all of space that exists called the electric field. And as charge, as electrons build up on that surface or the lack of electrons build up as electrons are transported away, that electric field gets morphed and, and pulled. And, it, and as it does that, you get this field that's generated, a vector field in space that we can quantify. It's a real thing. It exists. I mean, you wave your hand through space and you might just feel air, but there is an electric field at all points. And if you could see it, it would look something like this with these vectors that are pulling things towards or repelling things away from it. And uh, one of the things that you do in electricity and magnetism is you learn to calculate it. You learn to calculate this for a point charge for a line of charge, and then something called a surface of charge. And so we have to do something called a vector integral. Specifically, we do a surface integral, which means you take a three-dimensional surface like a sphere, and you have to learn how to integrate over that, considering that we're dealing with vectors now. And so that means that you actually have three, ve three integrals here. You have an x integral, a y integral, and a z integral. Each of them look a little different. And so we can generalize that. Luckily, there's a symmetry here. And that is to say that the electric field along the x-axis is the same as it is along the y-axis. And so we generalize to an r-hat direction, which means anything radially around this, if it's within a radius now. So we're able to save ourselves a little trouble. Um, but it is something that's you know very difficult to wrap your head around at first, because you've never had to work with integrals like this. They've always been lines. And this is the first time, usually, that you see surfaces and integrals over volumes. They're very interesting, though. And once you get a, a feel for it, you, know, you feel really smart. I mean, it's just cool to write this stuff. Um, the other thing that we learn a lot about is something called flux in electricity and magnetism. And flux is a closed surface integral. I think it looks really cool. Um, and the good news is it's not a vector integral in the same way in that it doesn't spit out three different components of, of the integral. It's just a single, what we call a dot product between vectors. So this is a regular number when you're done. But you take vectors in and you multiply them together. You smush the vectors together and you integrate that smushed thing. And you integrate little DAs, which means we, we talked about infinitesimals before, right? An infinite amount of basically lines going from A to B right here. Well, an infinitesimal DA, an infinitesimal area, would be like a tiny square. And you imagine it like a grid of pixels, and we're counting the pixels. And then we shrink the, the pixels smaller and smaller, and the resolution gets better and better until you have basically an infinite number of pixels that make up the surface A. And so the integral then of all those DAs would just be A, the area of whatever thing we have. And so we can kind of use mathematical tricks to simplify this. Um, but we do have to do some surface integration here. And when you first see it, it's a little scary. But the good news is most of the ones you do in ENM are very simple. And so they're walked through very clearly. And it's not terribly hard to do. So this is most of what you end up doing, though, are these really cool. Let me show you some examples of what these look like, too. So these right here, and this is from my favorite book, University Physics Volume 2. It's an OpenStax book, which means you can download it for free, and I'll put a link in the description below if you want to see more of this. Um, but we do have these different types of integrations that we do for point charges, line charges, surface charges, and volume charges. And they look like this. And the point charge is nice because we just take the sum of all the different points, and a single point in space um, it is something called a quantized charge. And what's really cool is this is the very kind of, you, you could almost think of it like your first ever close call with quantum mechanics in the sense that this energy, the idea of charge, it has a resolution to it and it is the charge of a single electron. You cannot split the electron and then get two smaller charges in space. You cannot get smaller than a point charge. It's like your, your, your limit to the resolution. This would be like your dA, your dV. This is as small as it gets. And so point charges in space, you can just add them up and you can add up the vector potentials that they create to get an electric field. And we do that right here. And so you don't have to know all the math, but at least you can see it. So line charges are the same, and you can see this integral is the same, but we keep adding these line, surface, and volume integrals, and the, the infinitesimal changes from a tiny bit of length to a tiny bit of area, and finally a tiny bit of volume that we have to calculate. Now what these look like, too, are, are much cooler to, I think, see the pictures than anything else. So we visualize these by looking at, say, the, the, the field that's generated by a disk of charge. And we actually use these. We've done these in labs. You can you know, take a, a piece of tinfoil, cut it out in a circle, and it creates an electric field that's very um, distinct. And if you put certain charged uh, like little bits of tinfoil around it, they'll interact in various ways.
There's also the electric field from a point charge, which you can see it looks like this. Electric field lines are a really cool unit of this because you do the math and then you're able to actually plot each individual contribution. And so electric field lines are basically vector fields in space and they can look absolutely beautiful. And you're able to actually calculate these if you wanted to by hand by plotting all the different vectors of the electric fields at given points. Finally, since we did mention flux, you can at least see what flux looks like here. And so here's that same equation that you might have seen before, E dot A, and what we do actually is we generalize that into um, an integral here, which is what you saw earlier. See, there's flux, and we have this closed surface integral, E dot a normal vector. And you don't have to know what that means, but you can at least see what that looks like. A normal vector is a vector that points outwards from every single point normal to outwards from a surface. So you get these very interesting shapes that you can describe in terms of normal vectors. And notice how at any point here, the vector sticks completely out, orthogonal to the like surface there. And so we call these normal vectors. And what we do to get flux is we take a uniform electric field, usually, although sometimes it might not be the case, and we're able to take the dot product of that, which is um, just a fancy vector thing of it itself, um, and you're able to get a, a, a value called flux, which is exceptionally useful in many different parts of electricity and magnetism. So in total, here is the map of all the calculus that you learn in physics in your classical physics courses. And hopefully you do find this interesting. You can definitely study any of these early and you'll learn quite a bit um, and you can carry that into other skills later on. But I think if you just enjoy the ride and you learn the physics and you learn the math as you go, you'll also appreciate the math more because you realize that it really is the language of physics and there would be no physics without this mathematics. And so you're able to kind of carry yourself. It's the vehicle by which the thought of physics can occur. And I think it's beautiful in that sense. So take a look here. If you have any questions, do leave them in the comments below. And if you found this content interesting, do like and subscribe because more will be coming. Thanks for watching. I've been Mike.